Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. This week on the Q&A podcast, Jessica Dulong, journalist and former chief engineer on a New York City fireboat, the John J. Harvey. As the nation marks the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, DeLong describes the ensuing rescue of nearly 500,000 people by boat off the island of Manhattan. It was the largest maritime evacuation in history. She tells the story in her book, Saved at the Seawall. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. What does it mean to be locally owned and operated? For Cenex, it means everything. It means that we know if you take your coffee to go or if you like to stay a while. It means we've helped Little Leagues get jerseys and local festivals get funding. It means we know what our communities need. So you'll always leave Cenex with a full tank, full of snacks, or full of smiles. Or all of the above. And that means the world to us. Cenex. Powered locally. Jessica DeLong, your book, Saved at the Seawall, Stories from the September 11th Boat Lift, is out in paperback in time for the 20th anniversary of 9-11. That's almost a generation in time. Um, what have you learned about grief and processing grief in the span of, of 20 years? Uh, so much. And actually, I feel like we are getting a, a, an advanced level course right now and soon to be really challenged on that front. All uh, all the experts in grief are really expecting a tsunami of grief arrive. Um, typically speaking, I, I actually am just writing a story about this, um, about uh, grief and, and the fact that it takes folks um, arriving at a place of some kind of safety before they can really start to grieve many times, which means that as we are shifting out of the, the worst part of the pandemic, hopefully, um, people will be getting to some semblance of, of what normal life will be now. And that is when we can really expect the grief to hit. Um, and so this is something that I've been really reading a lot about and listening to podcasts and um, going on to podcasts about grief. Um, I, I have learned that really the, the only way forward is... Um, is to not disregard where we've come. And so um, in the, the experience of having lost individual people, it means holding on to them. And there used to be a, an idea that um, grieving meant letting go of, of people who were lost or the job that was lost or the house that was lost or the identity that was lost um, or the way of life that was lost, right? Um, our ability to you know run into somebody at a, a, a Dunkin' Donuts or a coffee shop, right? Um, so... Now there's new thinking that really it's about staying connected and finding ways to forge ties, even with loved ones who are gone, so that we can continue moving forward with them rather than feeling like we have to leave them behind. Um, and in terms of, um, I've learned a lot about collective grief, which is different from individual grief. I mean, one of the real beautiful things about um, the way that people have grieved um, in the pandemic is that Many times if you are, have lost somebody or are grieving, um, you know, any number of things that you're grieving, you feel very alone, very isolated. And what's interesting is that ironically, um, even as many of us were separated and quarantining and trying to keep each other safe by um, remaining alone, um, there was also a sense of solidarity um, and a sense of um, that it was a shared experience that, you know, the world wasn't just going on without the loved one that you had lost. Instead, the world was actually on pause too. And so I'm really interested to see how we heal as a society. And we really have an opportunity to learn so much from the lessons um, of the aftermath of September 11th, when really everybody came together. I mean, it was a remarkable time. I, I know other places, but I was here in New York and New York City was just a just a transformed place and how people made space for each other and just considered each other with this kindness and um, and uh, shared humanity was really, really tremendous. And it's hard to hold on to that, I think, because you get caught up in your 
busyness in your life. And this is another moment that we have as, as there's a bit of re-entry happening. There's another moment that we have to remember that, to remember the caring for other people, to remember um, that we really are all in this together and that we are absolutely beholden to each one of us that we can't there's no such thing as a vacuum when it comes to a pandemic there's no such thing as isolation that will keep you um, safe we really are interdependent and um and i think those messages are really powerful right now um it's going to be really interesting to see how we come together in addition to processing either personal or collective grief for the events of 9 11 how should we, uh, again, it's nearly a generation, college students weren't even alive when it happened. Uh, how should we look back at the events of those days? What should we think about what happened to this country those day, that day? So in addition to um, looking back and seeing the way that people pulled together and the togetherness as, as an example of what we have, what of who we can be, right, and who we are. Um, it's been interesting to me and really kind of puzzling how um, how little attention the boat lift that evacuated half, nearly half a million people from Manhattan's shores in a completely spontaneous, not top-down, not pre-planned, very much improvised effort, right? Um, and, and this, it's hard to recapture 20 years later the, all the, all that we did not know on on that morning and there was no guarantee that this was going to be a de-escalation of attack in fact there's the staten island ferry captain um james parisi who said it, he in this great new york accent he talks about um being a feeling like he was on a, a big bright orange target in the middle of the harbor and thinking that the staten island ferries for folks not in new york are these huge bright orange boats um, that go back over and back over and back between Staten Island and uh, the tip of Manhattan. And um, so there was real fear. We really didn't know if this wasn't, you know, if the planes hitting the towers was not the beginning of everything. Um, so to your question, I think there are so many narratives that have been prescribed for us, really. Um, there's been a lot of, um, you know, chronicling of the horrors that took place. There's been a lot of the anger and the, um, the us and theming and, um, and, and, and really grief and shock and, and, and there's also resilience. And I think that um, the story of the boat lift, the maritime evacuation that um, delivered nearly half a million people to safety is an incredible example of the goodness of people that when you are given the opportunity to help, you have the tools, you have the skill set, you have the, um, the, the availability that, that people over and over again made the choice to put themselves in harm's way um, for the sake of fellow humans. And that is very instructive and something that we really need to continue to remember. So I think that this book um, and this anniversary gives us the opportunity to really reshape the narratives that have been fed to us um, and to reclaim that capacity for goodness that really is within all of us. Saved at the Seawall was first published in 2017, 16 years after the attacks. Why did it take you so long to tell the story? Hmm. For many reasons, it took me a long time to tell the story. Uh, for one, um, I, I honestly came to telling the story. I was um, approached by an editor who had read a, a piece that I'd written and um, encouraged me to write the book. And I was, I was very hesitant, to be honest, because of my own trauma surrounding uh, my service at Ground Zero. I was not there for the boat lift, but I um, arrived uh, the next day on the 12th and um, worked aboard fireboat John J. Harvey um, as a marine engineer. Um, and fireboats, both the active duty boats and the retired boat, which was the boat that I served on, um, which was called back into service, um, fireboats provided the only firefighting water that was available for days following the, um, the collapses of the buildings. And that for multiple reasons, but one was that um, fire mains were shattered when the buildings collapsed. Um, and also the hydrants were, were buried in debris. And so Hudson River water pumped ashore by large fireboats, um, some working still for the city of New York, 
as part of FDNY. And then the boat that I worked on at the time as a marine engineer, um, we we served down there until Friday, actually delivering firefighting water. And there was um, uh, a dear friend of mine who um, has now retired out of FDNY, but who was sort of our liaison with the FDNY when we were down there. Um, he uh, he told me this story about how um, firefighters inland really had no idea where the water was coming from. That was the last thing on anybody's minds. And they would go to wash their faces, which they were used to doing, you know, when you plugged into a hydrant, it's fresh water. And uh, and they would taste the salt and just sort of sputter and, and be very, very surprised that the Hudson River was what was actually um, providing the firefighting water. Um, so for me, it, a, a piece of it was that was... Um, a real um, hesitancy to really dive into this material. I'd written books before and I knew the immersion that's necessary. And yet I felt a deep, deep responsibility to be the one who would tell this story that in, in the you know minute by minute chronicle um, and create this definitive history because this is my community. As a mariner, um, I ended up being a chief engineer on fireboat John J. Harvey, so served for two decades, basically, um, aboard the boat. And um, and these are my people. This is my community. And I felt that this story was um, still going untold for so long. And it's, it's such an important, magical story of how people come together to help one another. Uh, and I And I felt like it was my my obligation to do it and to, to do it justice. We have a clip from a USA Today profile in 2010, just a brief one, that has you uh, talking about working on the Harvey. Let's watch that briefly. All right, I'm going to, I got to turn the compressor back on and I'm going to turn on the fans and uh, spinners off. I'm going to leave the valve open because we're going to have to pump again, but I shut the valve back there. So I think that's everything. What I like about working in the engine room is that it's completely physical. It's very tactile. I depend on all of my senses. It's a requirement for being able to do my job well. And at the same time, it's also a complete mental challenge too. And so it really brings together brain and brawn. The boat ended up opening up this world to me. It offered a connection to the Hudson River. It offered a connection to history. It offered a connection to the physical work that I found so incredibly satisfying. You told us that you spent 20 years uh, ultimately leaving as chief engineer, but when September 11th happened, how old were you and how long had you been a crew person on the Harvey? I was a total newbie. I had, um, I was in my late 20s, uh, I believe 28 at the time, and I had just started on Firebird John J. Harvey when the plane struck. Um, I had been um, working essentially an apprenticeship of, uh, of the type that very few still exist in this country. It was informal, but um, but it was an apprenticeship. I'd been working for six months and I had never, ever done this kind of work before. And so I was really just um, getting acclimated and really didn't um, didn't yet. Uh, think of myself as a mariner um, in the in the way that that one <laughs> ends up doing after a longer period of time. And uh, and so I, I came at this very, very new and, and I will never forget. Um, I, I came over. I was in Brooklyn that that morning. And so when I found out, was able to locate the boat, the, the fireboat John J. Harvey and find out that, that um, she was working down at the World Trade Center. I was able to get over um, by going to the FDNY Marine Division and um, catching a ride with uh, merchant mariners there on uh, a little go fast boat, pontoon boat. And um and I'll never forget the um, the passage from the Brooklyn Navy Yard over to the World Financial Center um, to um, where the boat was, and and the smoke and the you know the overwhelm and realizing that nothing would ever be the same for me ever again um, after whatever happened next, even though I didn't know what was going to happen next, um, and still having absolutely no doubt about where I needed to be and where I wanted to be. Um, and seeing the boat pumping water, doing the job for which she had been built in 1931, all of these decades later, was just, my heart just swelled. Um, and so all of the um, the, the tension in my body and the um, 
and the bracing myself that I was doing was uh, sort of there was a counter force of just uh, a swelling of appreciation for the craftsmanship that had um, permitted this boat to be able to do this incredible service for her city all of these years later. Um, and had she not been built the way that she was, uh, the way that things were built back in 1931 with this, just a fine eye for detail and um, and and just made very, very well. So that craftsmanship made this moment possible. And I had been on plenty of boat trips by that point after six months, and we had done a very long trip from um, Manhattan to Albany. But it was, a, you know, it was like a camping trip on the boat, and we would spray water and get kids wet, and, you know, everybody would scream with joy. This was a completely different moment. And here I was actually being able to participate in this critical life or death effort. Um, and that's because of this this boat that had been built so beautifully. Your boat, uh, uh, excuse me, your book is, is a timeline of the events of the day and how the, the fleets of different kinds of boats reacted in response to rescue uh, people who were trapped in the lower part of Manhattan. I want to get dig into some of those stories. And let me just start with the timeline. Uh, people who were Around, we remember all too well that the first jetliner, American Airlines Flight 11, crashed into One World Trade Center at 8.46 a.m. on September 11th, 2001. How long after that event did the first maritime response occur? Uh, one minute, within one minute, the first maritime response occurred. What and happened? it is not, So what happened was that... Um, folks who were there may recall that everyone thought this was an accident. There was a... Um, well, who knows? We don't know what everyone thought, right? But um, many, many people thought this was an accident, thought that this was a small plane that had, you know, gotten lost and ended up uh, hitting the tower by accident. And um, and even in that case, the ferry operators on the New York Waterway ferries who um, did, you know, regular everyday service from New Jersey to the World Financial Center knew that an accident, even an accident down at the World Financial Center would mean that they would, um, that there would be more people who would need transit um, out of the area. So even before people realized necessarily that there was a terrorist attack, the mariners straight away, there were mariners who, who uh, started pulling people um you know on onto the boats not pulling people but inviting people onto the boats um also some of those folks uh pretty early on were injured so there were um this was the fastest way off the island and so when the the plane hit even in the case of an accident there were still there was debris falling there were people who uh who got burned um and so the especially the new york waterway ferries who were such um fast responders they um, did, played a huge role in evacuating injured people um, to help them meet ambulances on the Jersey Shore. How long after that did the Coast Guard put out the call for all vessels to respond? So the Coast Guard, um, for, for all vessels to respond, that happened hours later. That happened at 1045 is when um, then Lieutenant, now Captain Mike Day, uh, put out the call. Um, and the Coast Guard made a remarkable decision to um, to facilitate the evacuation that was already well underway and to try to help, to try to help the mariners who were already doing a, like an incredible job um, managing this evacuation. And so what they sought to do, they um, disembarked from, um, to, to go over and do uh, sort of what they called it, a barrier patrol at the tip of lower Manhattan and, um, and to serve as a resource to basically give people information about um, which areas would have enough water for certain types of vessels to pull ashore. Because remember, the ferries, they were used to loading and unloading, uh, offloading par passengers. So they were used to, uh, to moving a lot of people, getting them on board the boat safely, and then um, making regular passages um, back and forth um, from the Jersey side uh, to the Manhattan side. But this rescue ended up involving tugboats, Army Corps of Engineer vessels, sailing yachts, fishing boats from Long Island. They were all just all manner of vessel ended up arriving. And um, many of these boats were deep draft boats, which means that there was a lot of boat <laughs> under the water. So there needed to be sufficient water for them to be able to reach the shore. And so the Coast Guard um, had information about, and not only the Coast Guard, I should say, 
um, that the Coast Guard actually teamed up with the Sandy Hook Pilots Association, and they um, their pilot boat was really well equipped um, to be able to serve um, the function that they were hoping to to meet the needs, the Coast Guard um, at at Ground Zero, and um, and so the Sandy Hook Pilots are absolute the pinnacle of expertise of of New York Harbor, its waterways, different um, you know objects under the under the surface of the water different water levels and so they had this incredible encyclopedic knowledge that they applied to um to help mariners who were um operating in completely unfamiliar territories some of them coming far closer to shore at strange places than they would normally in their day-to-day operations we have a bit of video from a u.s coast guard uh, film that they did about the sea rescue that day. This is Captain Michael Day of the U.S. Coast Guard about the call for all boats. Let's watch. As I left you know, the house that morning, I said to my wife, I, I told her, hey, I, I've got a meeting uh, in the city at, uh, at World Trade Center. <laughs> Another plane uh, struck the second tower. There was a little bit of confusion at the time. As one of the towers collapsed, we lost our ability to communicate. So I was sent out as as a relay just to pass information. Saw people jumping into the water trying to swim to Brooklyn because smoke plume was just forcing people off the island. So, you know, made that the, the call of all available boats. All available boats. This is the United States Coast Guard. Anyone want to help with the evacuation of Lower Manhattan, report to Governor's Island. Jessica DeLong, uh, one thing about about the cooperation level, you mentioned the, the the really important work that the Coast Guard does. But in the book, you talk about the many jurisdictions that typically have responsibility for the New York Harbor area: federal, state, New York City, uh, both New York and New Jersey. How did they work out the lines of authority on that day? It, it's it's such a good question, and um, I think there's still plenty of research to be done um, because it really was an unprecedented cooperative effort. And in, um, in a situation where typically there are, you know, hierarchies at play that are really pretty intense. I mean, even just within Mariner's, Mariner's relationship with the Coast Guard, it's a little bit like they're the traffic cops, right, in our daily lives as Mariners. And so it's like, oh, don't let the Coast Guard, you know, know what's happening over here, right? And so uh, there's, it's not the same, um, but it's also, it's not the same relationship as, uh, uh, as what happens on the streets, because Mariners also have this solidarity um, together, because uh, there's a long tradition of helping those in peril um, that was actually established after the um, sinking of the Titanic. It was actually codified and put into maritime law that um, if you could help without endangering your vessel or your passengers, the people aboard the vessel, then it was your obligation. You were legally required to, to come to the assistance uh, of another vessel or people in trouble. Um, now, that technically was not at play here because this was a, a land-based disaster for the for all intents and purposes. However, as, as um, Captain Day points out in that clip, a lot of people jumped into the water and um, they did so thinking that they would swim to New Jersey, which is not an easy feat by any stretch of the imagination, even for people who are really trained. The currents are tremendous in the harbor and um, and there was a ripping current that day that people report and people were getting taken out to sea. Um, there, there were multiple um, mariners who told me stories of, of doing rescues and, and actually a big um, piece of their so there's training there there are rules that you have to follow and so you have to do a, a monthly man overboard drill and so you pretend that somebody's you know gone overboard and you practice what you would do and actually because of that um because of that practice people were able to work really effectively to rescue countless people there's no set log of how many people were rescued um out of the water but it was quite a few um and so i think the the spirit of the day was we had to just get it done. And because it was an emergency situation, I think, um, I think, and 
<laughs> also because tragically what was happening in the FDNY was that all of the chiefs and the highest ranking folks the chain of command was broken down because so many people perished and so there was um the depth of the crisis was such that people were focused on getting it done and less focused on um rules and regulations um and captain day talked a lot a lot about how he was making rule breaking decisions that were far above his pay grade as he said um because he trusted mariners to know the capacity of their vessels so they were overloading beyond what coast guard rules would say but he um they were doing so safely and um and he had faith in them and he was looking at the larger situation that um that these rescues were necessary and quickly and so let's do it safely but you know it's okay to break some rules along the way now that changed um uh, another story I write about in the book was that um, there was also an effort to use the Spirit Cruise Line boats, which are these big um, event boats, essentially. So it's a great to have a party, a big party. And um, so they have these big kitchens. They had all of this food. They also have restrooms and they have places, um, you know, to, to relax. And so um, there was a decision made to bring one of these boats down to uh, North Cove, which is right there adjacent to the uh, World Trade Center and in the World Financial Center, and use this vessel as a um, as a respite and as a place to feed people and as a place to facilities, bathroom facilities. And, um, and for a while, uh, Greg Hantrow, who was sort of leading the charge to make this happen, he was trying to get permission. He went to the Javits Center. He, you know, he talked to uh, his friend, a, a police officer in the in the harbor unit. And at a certain point, he's like, OK, we're, we're not getting any yeses. So let's just go and do it before we get a no. And that's what he did. And then um, he got in, got that vessel in right before the clampdown happened. And very soon it became a. Uh, uh, a crime scene operation, which was very much, um, you know, fenced in and you needed a proper ID to be able to be there. And that ad hoc volunteer spirit was was changed. Captain Day in the clip talks about communications. 2001 was still the analog age. And uh, the, the also there was overloading of the cells that existed. Uh, some of them were knocked out. How did the communications work between all of these vessels so that there was a coordinated effort and chaos didn't, in fact, uh, endanger more people. I mean, it truly is just so incredible and such a testament to the professionalism of the people working on boats that day because it was incredible. There, These are boats that are not typically operating in these areas, right? They are performing operations which are not part of their norm. They're loading, I mean, tugboats, nosing up so putting their pointed bows against the seawall so that people can climb a short ladder and board the boat this was not standard operating procedure at all and and those tugboats are deep draft boats there's a lot of boat uh under the water that the there needs to be enough water to accommodate them without run, them running aground so the fact that this went off without any serious injuries is just it's incredible um, and the reason why was that professionalism. And a piece of that really came uh, came to the fore, given the communication situation. So uh, marine radios um, are, you know, a distinct pathway of communication because certainly, yes, cell phones were not going to work, although they did work on occasion and, and people were able to say, you know, hey, what's going on at Pier such and such um, by phone when they couldn't do it by a marine radio. So it was spotty. So both tools were used. But um, when the marine radios got too clogged with traffic and people were being mindful of trying not to, um, not to clog the airways, really, um, then um, people really did uh, almost like air traffic control signaling on board vessels, like just eye to eye, you know, signaling whose turn it was to come in and where. Also, um, uh, the Coast Guard did make a, a really helpful decision, which is that they designated a specific radio channel for communications with vessels to check in to say, hey, I have such and such capacity. I, I draw this much. This is the depth of my my boat. Um, you know, can I go in there? Should I go in there? That kind of thing. And so um, 
that was a really helpful role that the the Coast Guard uh, played to help communications. Let's go back to video. This is from a U.S. DOT film in 2011 uh, with a passenger and crew of the Staten Island Ferry talking about the rescue. Outside my building, everybody just was running everywhere. I live on Staten Island, so I was running towards the ferry. In response to the uh, plane attacks on the World Trade Center that day, Staten Island ferries were used for evacuation of uh, Lower Manhattan and the, uh, through the battery. When we got passes on the boat, we, we got them on the main deck and the saloon deck, and we had everybody quiet down to give them direction and uh, try to calm them down. My job is the safety of my passengers, my vessel, and my crew, and that's what I was concerned about that day. The boat was filled with smoke. The windows were open, like on that boat. You see on the, the second deck? So the boat filled with smoke. The passengers were praying, some of them were crying. We knew that there was a lot of lives that was gone. And people were just coming together. I saw people that I ride the ferry every day with that I finally actually hugged and held. Jessica Dulong, where would, were the boats taking people when they brought them off of the Battery and, and the World Trade Center area? Anywhere they could go. <laughs> um, so there were boats taking people to New Jersey. Um, certainly the, the ferry operators did their best to take advantage of the infrastructure that they had on on land to be able to disembark people quickly. So um, recall that you have to not only get people onto the boat safely, but you also need to have a gangway or some other mechanism for getting them off safely. And so um, which boats could safely do that where was determined by their, um, their, their structure. Um, so there were um, passenger designed boats that went to New Jersey, but then had to borrow gangways and set them up in odd ways, um, you know, through the loading dock door um, kind of situation. There was all of this improvisation that happened. Um, at one point, there was a, um, on the Jersey side, there was a tugboat who was offloading offloading passengers over a ladder that was, like, set up vertically. So people were climbing, like crawling across a ladder one by one. And um, a spirit cruise captain came on and said, look, get these people onto my boat and I will offload them way faster right now. You're just hogging this this space. And so the, they collaborated in, in a, some salty language was used, but they did work together um, to, uh, to offload people in a more efficient way. So New Jersey was one, you know, very common destination. Um, and another, uh, there were uh, NYPD boats who offloaded passengers in Brooklyn because that's where their harbor unit facilities were. So they knew that they could get people on and off safely there. Um, people went to Long Island. Um, one sort of later in the day, somebody said, I need to get to the airport because I guess they thought they were going to get out of town. And so uh, a tugboat actually dropped them off as close to the airport as they could get. So anywhere that people wanted to go. Um, and there were makeshift systems like makeshift ferry services that were established aboard tugboats. So the um, the crews of tugboats um, used bed sheets to and, and painted them to say Hoboken or, you know, some other de destination so that people could get somewhere closer to where they wanted to be. Because remember, and this is something that I think so much about these days, that um, when, when bad things happen, you want to go home. You want to go home, right? You want to just be in a safe place. And um, for some people, home was right there. And so that was actually one of the, the mariners um, lived right in Gateway Plaza, which is um, overlooking North Cove, right, right in that area. And um, he ended up uh, rescuing passengers and transporting fire department personnel. And uh, he talked about, you know, it was like two o'clock in the morning or whatever. And he finally was back in North Cove where he had started that day. And, um, and he knew his apartment wasn't, possible um and so he just sat there in the boat um the boat that you know which was where he worked it wasn't his boat um and he just sat there and opened a beer and looked at the red glow just not knowing what to do next um but if you had a choice to go home you would want to do that and so people did their best to yes evacuate 
people from danger, um, but also to, to get them as close to home as they could. At 9.59 that morning, the South Tower collapsed. It was 93 minutes after that first attack. Um, and uh, we have another piece of video. This is from a, a short documentary produced by Eddie Rosenstein and Rick Villeneuve in 2011 called Boat Lift, describing the panic after the first tower collapsed. Let's watch that. They were just streaming out of the buildings, and the first mode of transportation they saw was a, a ferry boat. That's when they knew, this is how I'm getting out of here. They didn't even care where the boat was going. There wasn't panic in New York in the beginning, just volume. It wasn't until the first building fell that there was panic. You heard the building go down, but we're in the slip, so we can't see it. That's when we started letting go, and then all of a sudden, it engulfed. You couldn't see anything. People were actually jumping into the river and swimming out of Manhattan. Boats were very nearly running them over. Wait, 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 wait. These people wanted out of Manhattan no matter any way they could. Jessica Dulong, uh, he talks about in the beginning it was just volume of people wanting to leave, but the panic that set in and also the injuries that began appearing at the dock. How did the whole situation of rescue uh, rather than just evacuation change when that tower fell? Um, the I would actually argue that um, that there was, for some people, there was panic straight away. Um, it just depended on, everything was contingent upon <laughs> honestly, geography and inches. I mean, one of the things that was remarkable uh, was uncovering that the, the, someone's fate was determined by whether they were here or one foot away, right? Um, and so people's individual experiences of what was going on that day were characteristically different based on what was right in front of them. And so there were injuries straight away that the ferries got involved with, but there were also compounding, obviously, as soon as the tower came down, um, it was everything escalated in this is in this really catastrophic way um there were horrific burns um people who were, were had clothing melted onto their bodies there w- were people who had um had glass in them um and the ferry captains and the crews i should say more the crews um, because they were on deck they had first aid training. So to be a mariner, you need to have, um, to get a license, you need to have some shipboard firefighting, some first aid training, some, you know, various things. Because when people are on a boat, it's a closed environment, right? Um, it's, uh, you need to be able to take care of just about everything pretty quickly when things go badly. Um, and so they they used that training. They used the um, first aid supplies that they had on board to help people um, and, you um, And what people forget, because so many people were in different places in Manhattan that they were able to just easily walk north to get away from the worst of it, if you will. But there were places on the tip of Manhattan where there was no walk north, where you were really, you were just trapped. And there were people who ran until they ran out of land and they ended up pressed against the seawall, begging for help. And when they wasn't coming fast enough, some of them jumped overboard jumped um jumped into the water and then were rescued um by by vessels um very often ferry boats were the ones who did that because they uh, were well equipped to be able to do that um but the the disaster just kept escalating and um and you know with every new event that unfolded it was clearer and clearer that this was not an accident and then the um the horror of that, the horror of people intentionally using planes filled with passengers as missiles to collide into a building, it was just unfathomable. It was just, it was just unthinkable. And even once those planes had penetrated the, the towers, there had long been this legend that even a plane hitting the tower would not make it collapse. That had been an, a, a marketing campaign when the the towers were built and so there was this belief that they could withstand um that impact and so when that first tower came down all um all assurances um were were destroyed again we're talking about a rescue of as many as half a million people from the seawall 
on 9-11-2001. You talk about the triage units that were set up on the shore points and one of them processing as many as a thousand people in a two-hour span. Had there been a lot of mass casualty training for uh, units such as this prior to 9-11, were they ready to go with this, or again, was this improvisation? Um, yes and no. So certainly mass, mass casualty training did exist, and there were, you know, there were uh, vehicles that were outfitted for big disasters, and there were protocols set up where uh, you use different colored tarps, laying them out for um, to designate which uh, degree of injury. So who needs to be, it's like a triage, who needs to be treated first. So some of those protocols were established. Um, but there was um, there was also this makeshift decontamination um, system that was set up. Um, and in some places, it was as rudimentary as people with fire hoses would just hose people down who were covered with dust because there was a concern of biological weapons um, and chemical weapons, um, which would then go from Manhattan to New Jersey, for example. Um, and so um, so some were more systematized um, and were sort of set up almost like showers. Um, others, it was just getting hosed down by a fire hose. Um, and so certainly I can say with confidence that this was absolutely something of this magnitude was not on the radar of most of the first responding agencies. Um, and instead what they did was they, um, they sort of cobbled together scenarios because they did do sort of preparation disaster scenarios. And so some would, uh, would be able to provide some tools for one part of this. Others would provide tools for other parts of this. And so they put that together um, and sort of drew from what they knew and what they had. So far, we've been talking about, a lot about process, but your, your book is filled with personal people stories about the day. Two uh, women who are threaded throughout your book, uh, Tammy Wiggs and Karen Lacey. Who were they and what can you tell me about their stories? First off, they're just such generous humans um, and the the willingness that each of them had to to share their story um, was is, was really such a gift and it's such a gift to history because without um, we're really at a place um, in society right now where we realize the power of story. We realize the power of collecting history from a, a wide diversity of voices so that we can really get a better sense of, of what's happening and what has happened and really understand ourselves better. Um, and so the, the gift that they and all of my sources gave in, in sharing some of their most horrific moments um, with me so that I could share them with, with the world. It was just, I just want to thank them for that. Um, so um, Tammy Wiggs was, um, I realized at a certain point that she was actually very much like me. She was green in a new trade. Um, she had just graduated and she was uh, on, on one of her first days of work uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. And, um, and Karen was, uh, was already a big wig on the floor. Um, and so she, uh, they ended up evacuating the stock exchange uh, together um, because the, the stock market closed, which is a very, very rare thing to have happen. And they ended up on the streets together. And, and, and Tammy was new to the city and really didn't understand the geography. And um, when someone said, well, just go, go walk north, she was afraid of being near the Empire State Building because she thought that it um, would also be a target. Um, and that sort of brings to mind the fact that people really we didn't know at that time if this was the beginning or the end of, of the attacks. Um, so she decided to, to go with um, Karen and Karen said, come with me. And she, Tammy describes being like a little puppy dog. She just followed her because she had confidence and she was just like, this is what we're going to do. And Karen lived in New Jersey. And so what Tammy did not realize is that by following Karen, she was walking straight toward the trade centers straight toward the disaster and the two of them got caught in the collapse of the first tower and um and they stood at the the seawall and um and jumped in and jumped in and the way that tammy explained it was that she um she knew she couldn't breathe because of the debris in the air and um, so she jumped in the water and she kept dunking her head thinking, even though it doesn't make sense, she said um, that maybe there'd be some oxygen to breathe under the water. So she kept bobbing down, the two of them bobbing down um, and bobbing back up 
Um, and then they realized that the current was incredibly strong. Um, and then they were clinging to the um, cement cement uh, blocks at the seawall, just digging in with their fingers, um, holding on. And that's when they realized that there was a fireboat um, right there. One of the boats that was tied up, that was, um, it's a longer story, but they were basically waiting for orders for uh, from their chief who had actually disappeared. And... Um, and so Tammy started screaming, we're in the water, we're in the water. And a voice comes through the smoke from the top of the boat, who's in the water? And um, an incredible rescue in, ensues um, in which actually Tammy, who would seem at this point like the, um, you know, the young one, the, the person without the skills to save herself, she actually does save herself because she is actually a sailor. And she ties, while she's treading water in the water, she ties the bowline knot, which is not the easiest knot to tie in a rope that's, you know, like the, the diameter of a Coke can so that she can then sit inside the loop and get hauled up to the boat. And the story continues, but it's just a, a remarkable, remarkable story. Were they injured? They both survived without any significant injury at all. Um, uh, they were because they were barefoot. They kicked off their shoes and dropped their bags in the water. Um, they actually walked once they did get to the other side, to the Jersey side, because the boat, um, the fire boat, John D. McKean brought them over. Um, they walked through the streets of New Jersey with no shoes on, and um, and actually Karen told the story about how she's like. Okay, I don't have my wallet, but whatever. I'm just going to stop at the local shoe store there. I know of it. I'll just go in and I'll get shoes for us. And when she crossed over to that side and she realized that the the store was shuttered, she was like, oh, it's lunchtime in New Jersey and the stores are closed. Oh, this is not just a, a Manhattan thing. Like that's when it started to dawn on her what a big thing she had just been through. Tammy Wiggs had both a sister and a college roommate who were in the World Trade Center complex. What was their fate? So the story of her sister was really, um, really powerful. Um, her sister, um, and it's actually personally powerful for me because one of the things that was very affecting was the, uh, a particular corner of uh, one of the World Financial Center buildings um, that was basically sliced through. Um, because of beams just slicing off the corner. And it was uh, very haunting to see that um, being down there. And that, it turns out, was precisely where Tammy's sister had been working. She had gotten out, and then she had a, a bridal uh, appointment later in the day, and she realized that she'd forgotten whatever she needed for that appointment. And she actually went back to her office in that spot and still managed to escape before that um, corner was sliced off. Um, Tammy's college roommate was uh, not so fortunate, um, and she actually perished in the collapse of the tower, the World Trade Center tower. How long did the boat lift rescue take place on 9-11? Uh, How many hours did it take to get all the people who wanted to leave or could leave off of the end of the island? Well, so there um, there was definitely no stop stopwatch running, right? And there was also this sort of um, ad hoc um, supply effort that was actually overlapping with the evacuation effort. So boats who had just offloaded passengers in New Jersey also picked up supplies for um, rescue workers in Manhattan. So bottles of water, bottles of eyewash, um, first aid materials, um, uh, torches, uh, protective gear, anything that you could think of. And so it, it wasn't there there was a hard stop. Instead, it just sort of progressed throughout the evening. And, um, and when they were no longer moving evacuees, they would end up moving um, personnel. So, you know, from uh, Secret Service personnel to fire department people, um, police officers, everything that you can think of. And so it was really this sort of amalgam of, of effort. Certainly within nine hours, um, the, the main thrust of the evacuation had, had finished, which is really remarkable when you think about, um, you know, the fact that this was an unplanned rescue effort, that it involved estimates, it, it seems like about 800 people, uh, mariners, but probably more, and at least, but probably more, 150 vessels. Um, and it just... It, Somehow it worked like clockwork, um, despite just the absolute disaster circumstances um, under which the rescue was established. 
people will remember that work on what became known as the pile uh, continued for months. How long were the boats that, that plied those waterways involved in that operation, the, the, the rescue, the cleanup, um, and the debris removal and that sort of thing? Yeah, so um, some of the vessels, so for, for example, passenger uh, boats, like ferry boats, were involved with moving um, uh, family members, uh, delivering family members to the site um, so they could see where their loved ones had perished and moving personnel. And that, that went on and on and on. Um, and then but there was also this debris removal because uh, in a place as uh, crowded for traffic as Manhattan, the idea of having to take, uh, you know, a million pounds, uh, sorry, a million tons of debris off the island in trucks was going to be madness. And plus, there was a concern for all the toxins that would be released um, if you're taking um, this debris over the roadways. So instead, what was uh, established was a um, really a, a debris offloading uh, area. And so the debris was moved by barge. Um, so for, I believe, two years afterwards, um, mariners were involved in um, removing that debris. And it ended up being, I think it was 1.18 tons uh, of debris. Uh, but they also moved um, supplies and equipment and food and um, and uh, rescue workers throughout. Um, and so it really was a, a, a remarkable effort Um and it was interesting because I had um, I had really come to love the harbor history, learning about the um, the early uh, cargo delivery, right? But break bulk cargo where everything was moved on and offshore by hand, quite literally. Um, there were no sea containers back then, uh, before the fifties, um, and uh, and so everything was moved hand to hand. And it was really incredible to be there at um, Ground Zero in the early aftermath and see that that's how things were being moved. Um, you know, I'm going to, there was a, a line and I'm going to hand you this, you know, case of water and you're going to pass it to the next one into the path and pass it to the next one. And that's how debris was moved off the pile in the early days too, bucket to bucket. There were bucket brigades. Um, and um, there were different protocols for remains and how they were mo- removed off the pile. But again, it was hand to hand. And so it was like a return to, the maritime history, which I talk so much about in my first book, My River Chronicles, um, that really just has such an appreciation for um, for the hands-on work that um, has made New York Waterfront possible. We have a little less than eight minutes. I have one last piece of video. Uh, this, again, from the Boat Lift documentary. Viewers who are interested can find it on, on YouTube if you want to watch the entire film. It's about 11, 12 minutes. Uh, and uh, this is uh, some of the observations and lessons of the day. Some of these people never been in the water, never been on a boat before. Housewives, workers to do with this. We had executives. And the thing that was the best, everyone helped everyone. I want you to hold my hand. Come on board. Get inside. One at a time. Get in. Get I saw four businessmen lifting up an old woman with a seeing eye dog, a German shepherd, and they lifted her up like a surfboard and passed her over the handrails. When we would carry a load of people over, and there was somebody standing there that seen her husband or wife, you know, that made us feel even better, you know. Well, at least we got two back together, you know. So keep on going, you know. The guy that works at the ferry, he's a, a welder. His son was on my boat. He, he actually came up. Uh, Thank me. Jessica Dulong, in our last minutes here, what did the work of the Mariners on 9-11 reveal about the human nature in a time of extreme crisis? Uh, I'm so glad you asked that question because I feel like that, it's actually so moving to hear. I've heard that video, <laughs> I've seen that video so many times, but it still is so affecting. Um, really, what we learned that day was that when people are called upon to help, they help. And, and what I think is such an important message is that um, in typical narratives about September 11th, we divided into heroes and everybody else. And there was incredible heroism that happened that day. And I don't, don't uh, want to diminish that in any way, shape or form. 
And we know from direct disaster research that the first first responders, the first people who arrive in, in the aftermath of a catastrophe or a disaster are almost always just regular civilians, regular people. And what we find, if you look throughout history, is that time and time again, while what we hear on the news is often the bad part, um, what actually happens is that people do rise to the challenge and help each other, that people do make the choice to use the tools and skills that they have at their disposal to be able to help fellow humans, and that there's not a question about, you know, okay, what side of the political aisle are you on, or, you know, would I like to meet you at a dinner party? There's none of that. It's just humans coming together because at crisis moments, the shared humanity is really all we have. It's all we have left. And it reminds me almost of um, the image of the planes going down and you reach out and you hold the hand of the stranger next to you. And the reason why is that we're actually all one. We're all connected. And especially in moments where um, we've really seen just striking divisions um, happen in our country and happen in the aftermath of the pandemic, it is such an important message to know that that's not actually all we are. We actually are this other this other thing. We are people who help each other, who recognize our shared humanity, who will actually go to you know, great lengths to put put ourselves in peril to be able to come to the aid of other people. And that that is who we are at our core. And I think um, it's a really good moment right now in American history as we're reshaping narratives and 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 re understanding who we are and where we've come from. It's really important to have that balance and, and remember that we actually do have this resounding human goodness that rises up in the darkest days. You went back to work and worked on the fireboat Harvey for another 18 years after 9-11. Many of the tugboat captains went on and back to their work. The the various vessels that you described from the the uh, spirit dinner cruises to the, uh, the ferries, uh, the captains and crew members back to work still running. You talked to many of them for your book. Uh, how were lives put together after that day? Was there ever really a normalcy after 9-11 for people who work on the sea down by the Trade Center? I don't think there's any, there's the possibility for any like return to what once was after events like September 11th, whether you were there or not. I feel like there's a a sort of a defining moment in time. Um, But I think that there there was a sense of the collective and there was a sense also of the urgency of doing some more planning um, and really getting um, some systems in place. Um, But I also think that, um, that it's really, uh, it's really important that people really understood their priorities in a different way. Um, They really uh, grasped what matters and and what maybe doesn't matter so much. Uh, One story that was really remarkable was um, an IT uh, a guy working in IT who was in the World Financial Center who um, was there when the towers were hit, didn't know that it was happening, ended up getting rescued by a fireboat um, after the first collapse. When he was there on the Jersey side, now free, um, you know, now he lived in New Jersey, he could have gone home. And instead, he saw the reaction in the faces of the firefighters who watched as the second tower collapsed, knowing that their brother and sister firefighters were within. And um, he asked to go back with them. And he actually worked with them running hose lines. And remarkably enough, he now is no longer in telecommunications. He's no longer in IT. He has actually become an FDNY firefighter in the aftermath. So that's a great story, I think, that um, talks about how the shifting in priorities can really you know, solidify life changes. The book is called Saved at the Seawall, Stories from the September 11th Boat Lift. The author, Jessica DeLong, who went spent 20 years on a New York fireboat at the harbor, uh, retiring as chief engineer, uh, chief engineer emerita. Thank you for telling us the stories of that day through the people who lived through it. Thank you so much for helping to share this important history. Thank you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. 
Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. 